1963, the United Nations gave Dutch New Guinea to Indonesia. The indigenous Papuans, who have lived there since time began, have been fighting for independence ever since. The Indonesian military, in an attempt to crush the Papuan struggle, have killed over 150,000 people. John Peterson Kuhn founded Old Batavia in 1619, the Dutch have slowly extended their dominion over the Indies. Until today, they rule over an area 62 times larger than the mother country. Their just and beneficial rule over Java and its 42 million souls, which makes it the most densely populated area in the world, and their successful supervision over the other islands in the archipelago, have proven them to be the greatest colonizers of all time. Well, what you've got there in Indonesia is, in fact, an empire itself. I mean, although uh, we imagined after the Second World War that by transferring power to local entities that were successors to the colonial regimes, we were in some way giving effect to the will of the, people, the local people, um, we perpetuated uh, local empires which... Uh, the European powers had established. In the case of Indonesia, of course, it's the empire of the Javanese because historically, if you go back before the Dutch occupation, um, these were all separate territories. They were ruled by their own people. There was no question that, for example, the West Papuans or the uh, Achenese were ruled from miles and miles away in Java. And this is the reason why you have problems there, that the military regime in Jakarta is trying to impose on the outlying territories of the archipelago, a rule which was historically never there before. The, the Indonesia is a fiction, it's a fabrication of the, the Javanese regime, which they were fortunate enough to inherit from the Dutch. In 1949, Holland transferred sovereignty of the Dutch East Indies to the Republic of Indonesia, except for West Papua. Uh, the United States uh, supported uh, Indonesian independence in the late 1940s. Now, the reason was that Ind uh, Indonesia was a Dutch colony and the United States was anti-imperialist in the technical sense that it wanted to dismantle the traditional imperial system so that it could take them over for itself uh, and incorporate them into its own neo-colonial system. So in that sense, the United States was in fact anti-imperialist. It supported Indonesian independence expecting that Indonesia would accommodate itself to the designated function. That didn't quite work out. And during the 1950s, the United States and Indonesia became, uh, had rather hostile relations. Uh, at the same time, uh, the United States continued to provide arms to Indonesia. This, incidentally, is a classic pattern. Uh, when you want to overthrow a government, uh, uh, what the classic pattern is to maintain very hostile relations with it, at the same time to arm it. Uh, the purpose is to find elements within the military who will be capable of carrying out a military coup and overthrowing the uh, government that you're trying to get rid of. Now I have uh, taken the decision, decision that I, President, Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces of the Republic of Indonesia, appoint Major General Suharto, this man, this man, I, ha I appoint him as uh, Minister, Commander of the Army. In October 1965, uh, the United States was rewarded with a military coup by a pro-American general, General Suharto, uh, who immediately organized and carried out a large-scale slaughter. Uh, according to Indonesian sources, about 700,000 people were killed in four months, mostly landless peasants. Uh, this uh, wiped out the 
only mass-based popular uh, political organization in Indonesia, the Indonesian Communist Party. Uh, and in fact, it opened Indonesia to uh, complete robbery on the part of uh, Western uh, corporations. Indonesia was now available to fulfill its designated function. The Papuans consist of tribal groups who have lived for centuries as autonomous group. So we talk about Asmat people, we talk about Arfak people, we talk about Imotu people or Paniai people, and all these tribal groups all together is well known under the name West Papuans. But in fact, they are all different autonomous groups. And the uh, tribal people have been forced to deliver cheap labor. They do not get any compensation. And if they protest it, they will be tortured for that. And at the end, they will be killed for the fact that they uh, ask for better salary or better treatment. But this, the company and the governments in general, do not respect. The, the only thing they need is the wood, is the fish, or the gold, or the copper, and they are not interested in the rights of the local, local people. The Americans, under General MacArthur, eroverden on 23 April 1944 the first stuk Nederlands grondgebied. Hollandia, with a symbolic name, was weer free. Detachementen van het Koninklijk Nederlands-Indische leger waren met de Amerikaanse troepen geland en gingen onmiddellijk in actie. Most of the capital comes from the United States, from Japan and from South Africa. Those are the main investors in West Papua. Ja, yeah, we consider any foreign company operating as West Papua as thieves because we are the righteous owner of the country of the land and what's on it and what's around it and what's in it under it but still the, these companies do not deal with the West Papuans they deal with the Indonesian government due to the framework that they had constructed this construction this international conspiracy in order to get their hands on the natural resources in West Papua. This we come to understand now. By supporting the Indonesian military system under Suharto, by having a big military support to this uh, Indonesian army, which operates in East Timor and in West Papua, and in the other parts of Indonesia too, they control the whole area. And by stabilizing the country, and by having this in a tremendous transmigration program coming in, they neutralize the population in West Papua. And all these enterprises can only operate if the situation is, is safe. After Brazil, Indonesia has the largest remaining rain rainforest on the planet. And since there has been pretty widespread destruction of the tropical forest in Kalimantan and Sulawesi and Sumatra and the other islands, the uh, exploitation has moved to West Papua. The destruction of the West Papuan forest has, uh, has many aspects. First of all, of course, there is logging. There are the logging concessions. and According to the SCEPI, which is one of the 10 or 20 so uh, Indonesian environmental groups, more than 70% of the forest lands of West Papua have been granted to concession holders. I think the other thing is that it is not only the logging, it is also road building and dam building and other projects undertaken by the Indonesian government that are wrecking not only the forest but the lives of the people who live off the forest and to whom forest is home.
50% of the Indonesian government's income is derived from oil exports. One third of this oil comes from West Papua. Today, there are at least a dozen multinational oil companies operating in the territory. West Papua is now becoming sort of open sesame for the mining companies on a much grander scale. This is partly to help Indonesia to, what is it, repay its debts to the West because it's got a huge foreign debt of about 50 billion. And uh, to, what is it, reduce Indonesia's dependence on oil and natural gas and to try to expand the uh, to diversify Indonesian uh, exports. So West Papua is the target very much the target, one of the main targets for this new expansion of um, mineral exploitation. And Freeport uh, is playing a big role in that, uh, as well as Ingold, in, uh, the INCO uh, subsidiary, which is also in exploring now the possibility of uh, developing mineral mining activities in West Papua. In West Papua, the US-based mining giant, Freeport Sulphur Incorporated, operates the world's largest copper mine. Yeah, the exploitation of the largest copper mine in, in the world is not uh, benefiting the people who have been living there for, for centuries. Uh, again, it's like with all the other investments in West Papua. They do not like to have Papuan laborers in their workforce because, according to them, the Papuans do not have the discipline. So people from abroad are brought in to to have the job, and sometimes the Papuans can do some uh, dirty work, but most of them, they just are pushed aside. They have to, to leave their lands and uh, try to survive in, in the surrounding. With growing international pressure for decolonization in the late 1950s, Holland prepared West Papua for independence. President Sukarno insisted that the colony belonged to Indonesia. He increased diplomatic and military pressure, culminating in a failed invasion attempt. the Dutch had shown for years a sort of a strong inclination to patronize Dutch uh, West Papuan independence. When it came to the crunch and when the US started exerting very strong pressure on, on Holland, uh, the, it, basically the issue of West Papuan independence and what the West Papuan people really wanted was lost. It was sort of just what is it, swept under the carpet and what became more important was maintaining Dutch-Indonesian relationships and of course maintaining US-Indonesian relationships and US-Dutch relationships, this whole triangular pattern that was more important than what, what the West Papuans uh, wanted. So all the negotiations that led eventually to the uh, New York Agreement um, completely ignored the West Papuan people. I mean they were just completely ignored. <laughs> What threatened to become a brush fire war in New Guinea is smothered in the United Nations as Indonesia and the Netherlands sign a pact. Under the agreement, the Dutch will transfer to the Indonesians the administration of the territory they both claimed. Until full transfer next May, it will be administered by the United Nations. And in 1969, the Papua natives will vote on either independence or continued Indonesian rule.